Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this seminar session. So I'm Yin Shou, a lead scientist at the Institute for the Public Understanding of Risk, and which also known as its short term as uh, IPU. And IPU is a research institute, and its research and activities focus on the public and the experts' perception of risks. And we all know that AI is increasingly influential in our daily life. And many of us encounter some forms of AI in our daily life. And how do we respond to AI recommendations and explanations and engage with AI? So today, yeah, we'll be hearing from Professor Fanelli discussing this very timely subject. Um, Fanelli is a computer scientist and professor of engineering and applied science and at Harvard University. She leads the Data to Actionable Knowledge Group at Harvard Computer Science. She and her team use probabilistic methods to address many decision-making scenarios involving hu human and AI. Their work spans specific domains like healthcare and wellness, as well as broader social technical questions around human-AI interaction and effective AI regulation. So you will be hearing more about her work now. Please join me in welcoming Fanelli. Hi, everyone. It's uh, such a privilege to be here. As a computer scientist, I know this is a really broad uh, interdisciplinary audience um, who are thinking about uh, decision making and risk in all kinds of different ways. Uh, so uh, again, I, I hope to share some uh, information, some of our findings, some of our journey um, as AI researchers who are trying to make AIs um, available to the, uh, not, ne not necessarily to the public, but to say doctors, uh, patients, other forms of decision makers. And I'm also really looking forward to uh, making this a conversation. Um, as much as possible. So uh, you're invited to interrupt with questions. You're invited to um, bring your viewpoints into this uh, conversation as well. All right. So what I hope to do is to start um, just with a little bit of scene setting. Um, I think we're all familiar that uh, AIs are uh, being used to provide assistance just about everywhere, right? Whether it's your Grammarly um, or an Echo or something like this to uh, driver assist in cars, um, co-pilot um, assisting with surgeries, you know, kind of really all over the place. Um, and sometimes we don't even notice um, it, that AIs are out there. One of the big things that I noticed um, as being part of the AI 100 report, like every five years, um, I was part of the, the, uh, a team that was assigned to like, what has changed between 2015 and 2020? And it was just like how ubiquitous these sorts of like little tools have become that we don't even notice anymore. Uh, I'm, I'm very, <laughs> what will happen in 2025 will be very interesting as well, <laughs> given the pace of AI development. Um, so my, my route to like AI, um, human AI interaction um, was really through interpretability in machine learning. So I'm a core machine learning researcher. My training and background is in computer science, uh, machine learning, statistics, these sorts of areas. And my core application area is in healthcare. And as soon as we started uh, applying all of these fancy techniques to healthcare, the question came up is, um, you know, is this model good? Right, that we know that the data have lots of problems. Um, is the model usable? So initially, most of my work um, and continues to be along the lines of oversight. Right? Can someone look at this model and say whether it's good or not? So I'll give you just a flavor of that, and then we'll move on to the, perhaps the question that's more interesting to this crowd, which is the, the interaction. Um, but in terms of oversight, the sorts of things that we've done is say that we have a clinical time series now. There are all sorts of methods for taking time series data and turning out predictions. Um, we have these uh, LSTMs, these RNNs, we have transformers, we have all these fancy models to do this. But the trouble is we cannot look inside those models and understand how they work. Um, so we've come up with architectures that go through and say, OK, we have different time series uh, along different dimensions. Can we find trends among those dimensions, combine those trends? into certain types of human understandable 
uh, concepts, turn those uh, concepts into clinically, semantically meaningful concepts like um, you know, the, the fact that these things are happening means that the patient is hypertensive, um, and then finally output the prediction. And each one of these steps is designed to be such that it can be validated by a clinician. Um, and that way, uh, someone can uh, look at the sort of outputs. Here's some sort of outputs that we can get. Where we're really, okay, we clump in these ways. Um, can you look at these things as an, ex as a, an expert in ICU care and uh, say whether these, uh, these things make sense or not, right? Um, so that's really the, the core work that we do in the lab. But as we've been doing this, uh, we've also started to work on human AI interaction for the purposes of decision making, which I believe is a very different task, right? And, and those of you coming from a social science or psychology background will be like, of course. Um, so uh, in the past, we've worked or continued to work a lot largely on oversight. Um, but today, I'm going to be focusing more on this question of insight or like how do you combine uh, human and AI tools together to ideally make decisions that are better than either one could make alone, right? That's really the, the goal that we would want out of these systems. But it does not always happen, right? Um, so what I will do is I'll just share a couple of examples from what we have done in our work, um, and then we will turn it again over into a conversation where I really invite everyone to, um, again, share their perspectives and, and questions as well. All right, um, so the first major takeaway that we found um, as we were doing this um, was about like, you know, how do people perceive uh, the utility of this AI um, and whether it actually helps them. And in particular, we did the following, we were doing the following study. One of my collaborations is in mental health. And in the mental health context, uh, we were trying to recommend uh, antidepressants for patients with depression. And we test, We did a study where we wanted to test two different types of rationales or, or explanations for decisions. So we would have some information about the patient. We would have the recommendation. So predicted stability here means like, is, are, are, is the patient going to continue taking this drug, which is kind of a proxy of whether it works or not. Um, dropout risk, is the patient likely to quit care because this drug was so awful? <laughs> um, and also a bit of why. Like, why are these therapies being recommended? You know, what are the major factors that produce this list over here? Um, and we experimented with two different ways of presenting these factors. Because in interpretable machine learning, there's a lot of different ways that you can try to expose elements of the model's thinking. So one possible way was to provide a set of features and say that here are the important features, and actually I can quantify even and tell you which one's the most important and the least important, and so on. Another approach uh, of providing the explanation is that you provide a bit of the glue, right, the rules, that you don't just say that the patient has QT prolongation and that went into this decision. You say, like, if the patient had, I'm using the following rule, if concern for QT prolongation, favor sertraline and avoid citalopram, right? Um, so these are two different ways uh, that you can provide the, the, the reasoning for why, or at least part of the reasoning for why these decisions came out. Uh, and then the goal of the study, we wizard of Oz this. So we made up situations where the recommendations were incorrect. Um, and the, the question was, um, would either of these approaches help figure out when the recommendation was incorrect and, and ideally, uh, you know, it, when the AI is good, you want to go with the AI's recommendation because maybe it does something that you have not thought of before. But when the AI is bad, you don't want to necessarily trust that decision. So what did we find? Um, so when no, no AI is here, um, uh, you know, we have a certain level of accuracy. Um, oh, by the way, uh, important point. So we, we tested this with a sample of about 200 plus uh, psychiatrists. So it's a fairly large sample uh, recruited from a, um, both a social media and a continuing educational list. So they all had at least a year of prescribing experience for, for these drugs. And they were given, again, vignettes like this. Um, so they were going to quiz like this to, to do. Um, and. Uh, uh, of these psychiatrists, um, you know, each one of the, the 200 plus in the study, there were certain conditions where they were given no uh, AI and just, just to get their baseline. Um, then how do they do when you provide a correct recommendation? 
um, accuracy goes up, maybe as expected. Um, and then when you provide an incorrect recommendation, unfortunately, the accuracy goes down below the level of nothing, right? So that's the gap that ideally you would want to uh, go away, right? Um, so then we dug a little bit deeper. And what we found was that when the recommendation was uh, incorrect, there's a particularly interesting trend, which was here's the baseline with nothing. Um, and these are just, uh, we can ignore these for now, placebo explanation, because sometimes just providing some text can uh, change how people respond. So we wanted to make sure that we wanted a ver version where there was kind of vacuous information um, and, and, and recommendation only. But what we found is that when we provided these expert rules, the accuracy went down, but not as much, uh, versus when we provided the feature groups. So when we, when we provided the, the feature groups like this, the accuracy went down further, more than it did when we provided this for incorrect recommendations, right? So this is a situation where you should not trust the AI. And it seemed that people over relied on the AI when you provided this form of explanation much more than when you provided this form of explanation. Um, and, and our takeaway, our hypothesis from that was that this one was uh, harder to read, but it gave you more context. Right? Whereas this one, it's kind of easy to glance at, uh, but you might make some mistakes as you glance at that particular description. Um, and what was interesting, okay, so that's kind of maybe what was happening here, but what was also interesting is that the perceived helpfulness went in the other direction. Um, because people liked the short explanations. They were like, these are quick, these are easy to read, um, but they were still making bad decisions based off of them. All right, so that was one study that we did a couple years ago. Um, this is now, I'm switching into ongoing work. So this is work in progress, um, where we wanna dig into this a little bit deeper. It, because again, we have this hypothesis that what's going on is that people uh, naturally, uh, we, we all know this, we do not want to expend the cognitive labor um, if we don't have to, right? Or if we're not made to. Um, that is a difficult thing for us to do. Um, and so maybe the right thing is to make the user pay closer attention only when close attention is needed, right? Like maybe that is one way in which AIs can assist with the human AI interaction, is to only require attention when it's truly needed. So we set up now a fake scenario because uh, we don't want to keep going to our, <laughs> uh, this, this pool of psychiatrists is like a, uh, something that we can only use a couple of times, right? We can't keep bugging them. So we made up a scenario that we can work on with just regular lay people. And here we have examples of, uh, or example of like how, uh, here's a process by which you have to make decisions of treating this like random alien, right? Aliens don't work like humans. So there's no prior knowledge that you're bringing to the situation. Um, but you know, it, given these uh, symptoms uh, implies these intermediate conditions, implies these um, uh, treatments will help. Um, you observe certain symptoms um, that our poor alien has, um, and then you're asked which of them would treat uh, the most symptoms, right? Some of these will, will treat only some of the symptoms, some of them will not treat um, the, the alien at all. Um, so it's a fairly hard task, right? Like if you've been looking at this, um, because we wanted to make it annoying enough, right? <laughs> like that, that it would be tricky and maybe having an AI say, I recommend uh, this, uh, this treatment because of this intermediate feature helps you look through this list with a little more targeted um, uh, uh, interaction. So we, we set this up, and we set up two different conditions um, for, or, or two types of questions and two different conditions. Um, so first of all, we, we changed up the, the difficulty of the, of the question. So all of the questions we controlled for the number of cases, uh, but there's ways to make the logic basically very straightforward or very not straightforward. Um, so we set up situations where, you know, you could basically find a line that would correspond to the symptoms and the decision was easy. And we also set up situations where you kind of would have to hop across multiple lines and maybe that's a little more difficult and time consuming for you to make the choice. Um, so that's the difference between easy and hard. And then we also tested um, whether you give this form of input, like uh, at the start, or whether you wait for someone to make their choice then they already had to cognitively engage, which is annoying, right? Like, 
Who wants to do a bunch of these questions? You all don't want to spend all of your break <laughs> right now doing all of these questions, yes? Um, and they had a whole pile to do. You know, they, they were told that you know, there's a whole room full of sick aliens and you have 20 minutes, you gotta treat as many of them as possible, but don't make any mistakes. Right, um, so uh, you, you could give, just give them a recommendation um, or you could wait and say that, you know, are you sure? You know, because maybe you wanted to do this other thing for this other reason, right? Um, and, and ask them whether they want to change their thinking. And, and what we find, um, the most interesting is kind of looking at the easy versus hard cases. Um, if you give the AI recommendation uh, beforehand for the easy cases, um, well, actually, accuracy doesn't really change compared to nothing, right? Because the easy cases are easy, and people can do them accurately without any AI assistance anyway. But that what the AI assistance does, if it's given beforehand, is it reduces, it takes an entire, uh, you know, 11 seconds out of about a 30 second task. You know, so like it's a significant decrease in time. Um, so for easy problems, giving that advice beforehand just kind of lets them go through even faster than they would on their own. Um, whereas if you uh, give that recommendation or information afterwards, um, it increases their, their time. Uh, on the hard questions, um, giving the AI before doesn't really improve their accuracy, um, and they, and, but they do go faster. So you kind of see that they just, it, when it's given before, they tend to, tend to do what the, 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 the system says. Um, but if you give it to them after, then they engage more. Um, their accuracy goes up you know, nearly 20% here. Um, and you take some hit in time, right? It takes them longer because they had to think about the decision and now they're being asked to reevaluate their decision and, and make a choice, right? Um, so this is, as I said, this is ongoing work. Um, like our next step here is to try to automate this process and optimize where um, ideally you would be able to help someone get through a pile of boring tasks faster and more accurately by speeding them up through the easy ones and then slowing them down for the hard ones, right? Um, and that's really the form of interaction that we're trying to create here. Um, and interestingly enough, um, the over-reliance on the AI, which means like doing the wrong thing just because the AI told you so, uh, reduces from about 50% in the AI before case to about 14% in AI after. So it's not perfect, but uh, again, like forcing people to come to their initial decision first is something that helps. And this is not something uh, necessarily new in terms of like the literature, like there's the various anchoring literature that says that if you ask people to make a decision first, it helps anchor them to a particular point and then they change, uh, they, they, they think differently when you, you provide the alternative. Uh, but what we're trying to do here is now really take advantage of the, like what is the gain that is possible um, by leveraging this effect in the way that we want, um, speeding up when possible and slowing down when, when we don't want them to. All right, so yeah, go ahead. The, the first one was with psychiatrists for the drug recommendation. Hmm. That's true, that's true. Although, t t maybe to that point, um, so oh, I'll repeat the question, so I, I don't know if that's useful for the recording. Um, so the question was, that it, does, helping, does having the explanation in the form that they're trained um, help? And absolutely. Um, though I will say that these, um, these rules here um, came from guidelines. So what we did is that there's a, like a whole bunch of guidelines. And what we did is we chose the guidelines that were relevant for this patient, for this decision. Um, so we were kind of personalizing the, but these, were, these, these should have all been familiar. Um, right, right. So, so the, the right side, I would assume is familiar, but the left side maybe, I'm not sure if that's familiar. That's true, and uh, so but I guess, uh, so it was less familiar, but they over relied on it. <laughs> they did worse with this. Um, they liked it better, but they it performed worse. Cute. Yeah, <laughs> so maybe there's a combination of things going on there. And, and a similar point with the other part, uh, mm. the, the second part uh, is that when you use tools, right, you need to know your tools well. Mm -hmm. right? Absolutely. Like, uh, so, if you use a foreign tool, 
then the result is somewhat random. Um, but if you know your tools well and you sort of know where, where the tools work well, where they don't work so well and so on, then you can use the tools better. 100% agreed. And, and so there, but there it's is... But to control for that effect though. Yeah, so there's a, there is a, I, I don't have the graph on here, but there is definitely a learning effect that happens um, over the course because we're asking them to make these decisions. Uh, not only learning the tool, but learning the task, right? Like most people are not used to like, you know, going through logical formulas to try to find uh, various satisfying or maximally satisfying answers. So um, we, we absolutely have that. And in the, in the full analyses, we control for, for that sort of effect as well. It's a good point, yeah. Is there, and did you explore a sort of second order learning effect? Did you tell people how they did on the task and then give them the task again? Um, that is a great, but that's a great sort of thing. We did not, ha we didn't have the time in this study to like, because this was on prolific. So this is a online sort of thing. And it's like hard to get people back. I think it'd be really good to, um, if we can get two groups, right? Like when you get the large online group where you can get, you know, hundreds of participants very quickly. <laughs> um, and then also, you know, have this thing where you can invite people back or um, invite the same participant back. That's a great point. Yeah, but we did not do that. Yeah, hi, hi Finani. Uh, the following on, on this easy and hard question uh, scenario, um, um, I just suddenly remember that in, in medical imaging analysis, uh, one application of AI is that we help the radiologists to uh, prioritize the cases. Yes. Then we, we rank the difficult cases up front and then saving the easy ones at the back, right? Uh, so that they can concentrate on the difficult ones. But as you mentioned, no system is perfect, right? So we will, by some chances, right, or some percentage, have some difficult cases kind of wrongly ranked in the lower. Mm -hmm. So, so would that such? But would that? I don't have data. So, to wonder, you have any data or experience that, or what? What may be the potential effect when we kind of suggest to the reader that this is a simple case, but in, in fact, this could be a difficult case, right? Have you any experience? Right. I mean, that? I think that so. So the users don't know whether it's easy or hard in this case, and there's just an error rate that's constant across both types in terms of the AI. So my guess is that if you incorrectly, oops, um, if you incorrectly said that um, uh, this, I think this case is easy, so I give the AI before, then you get a high over reliance. Um, so I, I do think that. That's just going to be what happens. For this study, we assumed, or we, we have perfect knowledge. Like a separate thing in our lab is uncertainty quantification. So we're trying to say like, okay, if, if this group of students figures out the problem exactly right, <laughs> what's the best we could possibly do um, on the interaction side? But it's a really good point that it's not going to be perfect. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Just a quick question, I might have missed it. How do you measure over-reliance? Uh, we measure over-reliance as the proportion of time that the person takes the AI's action when the AI is incorrect. Because we okay. know how often the recommendation is wrong, um, and then do they decide to go with that AI recommendation. Mm -hmm. And so uh, in this case, if you give the recommendation beforehand, about half the time people will just follow it even when it's wrong. Um, and if you give it after the fact, in the situations where it's wrong, it's about one sixth of the time. Um, but say, but the if it's without AI, then the subjects are they they might make the wrong mistakes. And sure, absolutely. Yeah. Um, so so they may. Uh, so that's a different question. You know. So that's like yeah. what's their. Uh, so this this is change in accuracy from mm -hmm. without. Um, so that gives, and an, um, I, I, I don't remember exact numbers, I believe that the, the subjects on their own are bit around 70% accurate. Is it also possible to um, take another measure that if you provide wisdom, um, provide AI for them for a while and then take, take out AI? What happens? Yeah. Oh, that's a good question, because we do randomize when this happens with the different mm -hmm. conditions. So we could definitely take a look at that. That's a great question. Thanks. 
as I said, this is this is a study that was you know like completed last week or like phased this week, but I thought it was very relevant. I wanted to share. So these are great suggestions. All right. Um, no, so the, so there was a question about like you know how much does training matter, and, and I get I feel like this is going to be obvious for everyone in the room, but I'll just uh, I'll, I'll share anyway. Um, yeah, it can be very hard to change how people have been trained. Um, was another observation that we had now in a study um, involving judges. So in this in this case, um, the original purpose of the the, the research proposal, the grant, um, was to say, you know, here are here's information that goes into making a decision about whether someone gets bail. So does someone get to go home between arrest and trial, or do they have to stay in jail between the two? Right. Um, so the, to make this decision, um, you know, there are all of these different factors that go into that the decision that the judge makes. And uh, there's a variety of systems that are supposed to help uh, improve fairness by um, automating this, or partially automating this process, because you don't want judges making you know, arbitrary decisions, right? Which, uh, you know, has, that, that's the argument. It has its own many other issues, because you know, if there's bias in the training data, you have bias in the Purdue system, um, et cetera, et cetera. So it, right, and so here's a sort of recommendation that might come out of the algorithm. And one of our hypotheses was like, what if you want to try to get closer to the best of both worlds in the sense that you maybe want to nudge the judges in one direction for the purposes of standardization, that you don't want someone to make a decision, you know, just because they feel grumpy or someday or like that. Um, or, uh, but you also, you know, don't want them to perpetuate biases in the system. So, you know, when instead of just providing the recommendation, we know people tend to over rely. Um, what if we could provide some additional information about that decision, saying that, and this is really not AI, right? This is very simple logic, um, where we're like, oh, okay, uh, you know, here was the here was a decision. If the if the defendant had been different, um, you know, uh, in these ways, then we would have a less restrictive recommendation. If the defendant had been different in these ways, it would be more restrictive. Um, and then you can kind of take a look, um, and what we, or rather we were expecting is that uh, judges would take a look and say, oh, you know, if, if a major factor was a failure to appear for your past trial, um, maybe the judge would ask, uh, you know, why did they fail to appear? Um, did they just decide not to show up? That's kind of different or skip town, um, which is very different than, you know, oh, you know, their, their cousin had a heart attack and they were taking them to the hospital. Uh, and that's why they didn't show up for the, the trial or something like this. Um, so we were hoping that by providing explanations of these forms, we could you know, encourage the judges to take a closer look at the, those features and ask themselves, you know, is this recommendation the right one based off of the, the features that were used? Um, and what we found <laughs> to this point of it's very hard to change how people are trained or training makes a big difference um, is basically this, so this, is, this study failed in its, its goal. <laughs> um, because as we started doing this, uh, we, we basically found that the judges did not use the information um, at all. Um, and not only did they not use it, uh, they told us that it, they, they did not want to use it, um, that they felt like it was against their training to use it. Um, and we, here's like one pull quote from, from the study, um, because they were like, well, they, this information, like this, um, would not change their decision uh, because nothing has changed about the defendant. You know, th these are ifs, right? These are, you know, if the patient had, uh, if the defendant had been different, then I would, then, you know, you would make a different recommendation. But I am interested in the defendant who is in front of me right now. I am not interested in this hypothetical other defendant that does not exist, right? Um, and they, they, they were very clear. They were like, I have been trained to focus on people in front of me, right? Um, and they, they, some of them had a very like kind of moral, ethical kind of view on this. Um, and so, uh, you know, if it didn't happen, which you're telling me didn't happen because this is the person in front of me, then why would I change my decision? And, and so, and, and this happened across the board. It was a small study with just, uh, you know, we, we got very consistent results around eight uh, judges and you know, each one we had for like an hour, a little over an hour, um, and they gave us kind of the same results. So very small qualitative study instead of doing, their initial plan was to do a larger quantitative one. Um, 
But I think it goes to this point, like probably if we had spent much longer training them, we, we had about 20 minutes of training um, in this study, uh, we could have uh, moved them to maybe a different way of thinking, right, about this information. Uh, but uh, again, goes to the point of like, especially in professional situations, it seems like that training element is, is very, very crucial. Again, no, no surprise to people here. All right, so the last two examples um, that I'm gonna give um, and then we can move into discussion. Um, one, uh, again, maybe it is no surprise, but uh, people think differently. So like in the past two examples, you know, we've kind of been treating, you know, the, the, the users, the, the participants in the study is just like a homogenous group of, of people, right? Um, and in this particular study from uh, a few years ago, at this point, we were trying to use examples to figure out how people would extrapolate. Um, because at the time, and it's still kind of popular to explain AI algorithms using examples. You know, like I am recommending that you make this change to your code because this, this type of change worked in these five other situations. I'm encouraging you to give this treatment to this patient because this treatment worked in these patients that look similar to you, right? So it's a, it's a natural way of providing explanation Oftentimes for people, uh, like kind of qualitatively or you know, subjectively, they seem to like that sort of explanation. Um, it, it fits our heuristic you know, type one thinking, right? We're kind of good at processing it that way. Um, but we have to remember that our heuristics work differently um, than, or different people have heuristics that work differently. So in this particular study, um, we, we, it was a toy example. So we, we gave examples of, uh, a, a situation where some of the agent, the ag there's an agent who is trying to move around on this little grid, um, can move in any of the four directions. And the question is like, where, which, you know, some of them are labeled, like if you're here, you go to this square, if you're here, you go to this square. Um, but some of them are unlabeled. And we asked participants to take these examples and fill in the, the labels, right? Um, and then we gave a, a different study, or different setting, rather, um, where we again provided examples saying that, you know, here are values of certain biomarkers um, and these are the treatments that are given um, as time progresses. Um, and then here's the test case, like what would happen in this particular test case over here? So it's an equivalent sort of question um, as this one over here, like what happens in this square, unlabeled square, is equivalent test case to like what happens to this one. Um, but it looks quite different. Um, and importantly, uh, we all probably kind of know how game boards work, right? So this is maybe a little more intuitive. Um, and maybe for, um, uh, for, for if I tell you that, hey, there's like an agent moving around on this board, you think maybe the agent's trying to get somewhere, right? It's a natural way of thinking. Um, whereas if you look at this, um, if you're an average person looking at it, you're probably confused, right? Like, I don't really know what's going on. I don't know anything about HIV. I know nothing about the different treatments, um, you know, A and B, what is, what is even this? Um, uh, the best way for me to make this guess is maybe to find a copy in the, in the data set that looks, that looks similar. So our hypothesis was that in the first case, people would be goal-driven or kind of infer a, a set of goals. And here, they would probably do some sort of matching. Um, and this did kind of turn out um, in terms of like we had people do both the, do the study compared computationally how they performed to like matching or goal driven behavior, uh, but then we also asked people to explain their reasoning in a text box of how they made certain decisions. And what we found um, is that okay, uh, overall yes, in the HIV case, imitation learning happened more often. That's the matching. Uh, in the grid case with the agent moving around, um, inverse reinforcement learning happened more often. That's kind of inferring goal directive behavior. Um, but you know, many times people try to copy. And in the grid world, but also in, in this one over here, there's a significant number of people whose, whose process really didn't fit, fit cleanly into either, right? Um, and I, I point that out just as a, like a, a caution in terms of providing explanations in the form of examples, right? If we're trying to say, trust this system because it worked well in these other cases, um, maybe goes back to this training element that if you trained, then you understand it. 
but people might extrapolate differently and say, oh, the, the similarity between these examples is all about the gender, or the similarity in these examples is all about the age, and they might lock on to different features um, when making these, um, these connections, because the, the machine no longer specifies how that computation happens, right, from explanation to recommendation. Um, whereas in the previous case where there were rules, right, like QT prolongation, avoid sertraline, right, the, the machine was being really clear how it came to its conclusion. Right? Whereas when you give examples, there's a lot left implicit, and then people can fill those in um, in different ways. All right, and then I'll give one very quick last example um, so that we can get into discussion. Um, and, and that last one uh, is something that we are, we've done some work and we're hoping to build on this idea where you know, we, we really want to empower people to make good decisions, right? Like the point is not for the AI to uh, bully people into making a certain choice <laughs> or not, um, but it's how do you put them together. Uh, so what we did here, going back to that psychiatry problem from the beginning, is that rather than providing a recommendation, a recommendation with explanation, we um, created a, a sidebar where you could populate um, various information about the patient, um, pre-populated by um, the information from the health record, but you could change it if you wanted to. Um, that's again about empowering the patient, being like, oh, you know, that thing was measured about me 10 years ago, is no longer relevant, um, or, you know, I've been having trouble sleeping, but I do not have a sleep disorder diagnosis, please put that in. Um, so now they can kind of adjust these conditions as they, as they wish. Um, and as they adjust these conditions, um, uh, they, you end up with kind of not just one choice, but many choices, right? Um, that which drugs might you uh, might work well for you, and because of what feature, um, which drugs might maybe work, maybe not, which ones should you avoid, and for what reason? Um, and when we did, like, this was, a, again, a qualitative study with about 16 participants. What they really liked about this, um, in terms of you know the, they taking a drive of the interface and using it to try to explore questions, um, was that this level of interactivity actually increased that engagement, right? That uh, engagement that was not present when they were just given those very quick to process um, explanations. Um, and they also felt like, oh, this is something that I could chat with my patients with, right? Like instead of me looking at a screen, me and my patient will look at a screen uh, together. We'll, we'll, we'll toggle through. And because there's so many choices, no, no choice is favored, right? Um, you, you again, you, you don't have quite that same effect of like, okay, the system tells me to do X, um, I will do X. All right, so just in summary, um, you know, my work has to do with interpretable machine learning. We try to take elements of the machine learning system and make them interactive, make them available to humans, ideally, so they can make better choices. Um, the goal is that you know, transparency can enable uh, calibrated trust you can know when to use the AI, when to not use the AI. Um, and and uh, related to that, interactivity um, can uh, you know, empower more sophisticated teaming like this over here between the AI and the, and the human. So one, one other thing here that I don't have on the screen because it was just like too hard to fit on here was that we also had scores that changed, like you know, probability that this, uh, if, you, if you take this choice, you can hover over it and see like, okay, what are the odds that the patient might decide to quit care because you know, they might have a bad effect or something like that. Right. Um, but as you all in the room clearly know um, and, are, and are experts in, um, we need to think carefully about the design of these interactions because uh, you know, people like me, you know, we, we go into this field because we're like, okay, we built some tools. Um, clearly people will use those tools exactly in the way that I think I would use those tools, uh, which is not true. Right, um, and, and people don't often often do not act as designers uh, uh, expect, and I think that that's uh, you know for people like me, I think there's a lot of really interesting research questions. Uh, for example, like when do you provide the information before or after? Um, do you make it um, interactive in certain ways? Um, you know, what are these tools that we can use to get people past their biases? Right, that um, as AI designers, we know the warts of the AI system, right? We're like, we really need input from people um, to make these AI systems do better when we don't have complete information, um, when we don't know about preferences or rewards or these sorts of things. Uh, but clearly people also come in with all of their sorts of biases as well. Um, and then ideally we would end up in a situation where you put the two together and kind of overcome the, the issues of both. 
Cool. So I will pause there. Um, we can move into conversation phase, questions or conversation. Yeah. How does a grid world work? So the idea with the grid world um, is that the, we, the, the users were just told that um, there's an agent that's optimizing something. Um, so the agent wants to collect the most rewards. Um, and here are the decisions that it makes. Um, and then from that, people had to do the rest of their inference by themselves. Um, so a lot of people uh, inferred that like the blue areas must be somehow valuable because it looks like the agent often moves toward blue areas. Um, but that was left on purpose um, less specified, right? Because we were testing to see, you know, do people kind of presume a goal when you say that the agent is trying to, uh, you know, wandering around a space. Presume. That's right. You. You're right. It, it, as opposed to here, people didn't necessarily presume there's a goal. Even though if you imagine that you're treating HIV, clearly there must be a value here that's like the right set of things to do. Thank you. Thank yeah. Uh -huh. I think there's. Oh. Oh, yeah. Can I ask two questions? Sure. Um, one is. Um, on the facilitating of trust between human and AI, um, does it align to like, was, was it, could it be like quite similar in a sense to like facilitating the trust between laymen and experts? Uh, that's a question for this room. <laughs> I don't know how trust between laymen and experts work, but I imagine you all do. <laughs> um, I mean, I think in terms of trust with the AI system, Mostly we've been trying to get the calibration of the trust because people tend to either over trust or just not ignore the AI system. Um, and we are trying to really find ways to signal that this is a time when you can, def the AI is definitely right. This is a time when the AI might have something useful to say. Uh, maybe like, okay, I can't say for laymen and experts, but I can say that when I answer people's questions, you know, I will be like, hey, I'm not an expert in this area, but I, here's my thoughts, right? Uh, which is different than saying that, you know, I know this math, um, you know, it is absolutely correct. <laughs> um, so I think we're trying to teach our systems to do the same, but how it is received, I, I, I think that's, that's you all. <laughs> Okay, and the other thing is the study on the uh, with the judge mm. uh, reminds me heavily of the uh, Daniel Kahneman's book on noise. Mm. In a sense, like the trust part, I wonder if like trust is harder to be facilitated uh, in terms of like trusting the AI is going to be unbiased uh, rather than trusting the AI to be like uh, not noisy, like less noisy in the decisions. I mean, AI must be massively l lower in terms of noise. Uh, in terms of their recommendations compared to humans, right? It, it is significant, right. I mean, it, humans have lots of noise. AIs have no noise, basically. Th these are very easy or straightforward decision-making systems. Like, these are, the, the rules are very simple. So there is no noise in there. Yeah. I, I, but there wasn't really dis, I, I mean, our issue was more a question of, again, over-trust because, uh, I, I guess the, these judges were in districts. So we, we used, in, for our study, we, we used districts where um, these sorts of tools were already in practice. Uh, and we did that because we didn't want to have to, speaking to the notion of training, we didn't have to want to teach people what the tool is and then also um, you know, what the explanation is. We wanted to just say, you're familiar with this tool, and now we're going to uh, take that tool, we're going to give you a little bit extra, right? Um, so I don't know if that was a, or I'm sure that that was a possible bias, right, in the sense that uh, districts that have adopted the tool do a lot of marketing to be like, hey, we are providing you this thing, it's going to help you make more standardized, fair decisions. Uh, and, and the judges actually, because we, we had this as a think aloud uh, interactive exercise or like a little over an hour with them, uh, you know, would tell us that, you know, this is, we, we've been, you know, we, we, we don't know any of the math or we're not scientists, but we've been told that this is very scientific. <laughs> so, yeah. Thank you. Hi, um, thank you for this talk. So I guess um, you're really conceptualizing AI as uh, uh, like a decision support system, 
And this is the, the, this a set of cases, yes, yeah. that we're presenting here. Um, and I guess, so within a decision support system, like you're trying to improve the agency of the person by giving them tools. That's right. And not take away their agency by just like saying this is the answer. Mm -hmm. And I was kind of wondering, within the examples that you've given, you're not giving them any like feedback, right? You're not saying, okay, so you chose the AI's decision and you were wrong. So you're not mm -hmm. like allowing them to calibrate their trust in the system at all. So what we've been trying to, and that kind of relates to your question as well about, it. so we when we do these sorts of studies, um, like these, we do tell them after each interaction whether they got the answer right or not. So that level of feedback they do have. Um, but I think it's still, it's, a, it's, it's complicated in terms of study design over a relatively short period, because also if we're changing up the, the different, like, you know, the agent makes mistakes and doesn't make mistakes sometimes and all of this, um, you know, do we want people to learn a base rate? So actually, in in this study, um, this the, the psychiatry study, we purposefully tried to avoid having them learn a base rate by saying that, hey, we're going to give you examples from ten different systems rather than saying that this is one system that you're seeing ten examples of, uh, just to avoid because there's just kind of because otherwise you kind of say that well, the AI has been wrong a couple times, so it'll probably be right this time, which we also know is false statistics, but <laughs> is how people think. Um, so it's, it's a great question. It's, it's kind of tricky to... So, so just to follow up on that, have you, with the, the next study, the one that you've just completed, have mm. you checked to see how their trust develops over time? Like, okay, so this one was wrong, and I relied on the AI, so next time... I will not That's really a good question. Yeah, we've seen the overall learning effects, but I, I haven't checked. I don't think we've checked for overall over reliance checks. Like, do the over reliance go down or does it uh, go up? Or... That's a great point. Yeah, thank you. Hi, thank you for this talk. Um, so my question is regarding um, the confidence of the AI's decisions itself. Does that have a relationship with the people's choices? So, for example, if the AI um, AI rec recommends something and um, there is a confidence score attached to it, so it's sometimes very confident, sometimes it's not so confident. So, does that have a relationship with the with people's choices that they they are choosing it to be like they are trying to rely on it when? it's it has a higher confidence versus not right right right. so we have not done this study but i believe other people have done similar studies that where it kind of helps but people have a really hard time parsing what a confidence means like how to pay attention to it so in the in this study that we're doing now kind of ongoing uh, what we plan to do is just incorporate that into the back end that if you're sufficiently confident then just provide the answer in advance if you're not very confident, uh, don't say anything, right? Don't yeah. even try to help. Um, and if it's in between, then um, uh, you know, maybe provide it in a in, maybe provide it after the fact or with some you know caveat. Of, you know, this may not be uh, helpful. Uh, but that that's my gut sense from reading the literature. Again, uh, you all in the room are are experts on this. Yeah. Thank you. Hi, hi, Finale. Thanks a lot for, for the sharing. It's so very, uh, very insightful. Uh, for the last example, right, uh, about all the recommendations at different category, I do agree that I think there's a brilliant uh, uh, idea, to, as the gentleman mentioned, other than forcing the recommendation on the user, we provide the options. Uh, my question is, but in machine learning, right, for a recommendation system or IL system, uh, all these recommendations are often associated with a confidence score right. or some sort of beneficial score, which is a continuous number. Then how do we decide the cutoff to separate them into like, okay, these are the favorable recommendations. And from here to here are the neutral ones. And then down there will be the things that you should avoid. So the cutoff, how do we find, yeah, how do we define these cutoffs? I think, I think that's a great question. And I think, it, so I think there's two pieces there again. Like if there are situations, uh, there's a type of uncertainty that's like, I don't know where this drug goes, right? Like I really just don't have any idea what's gonna happen with this drug, right? And I think if, 
if that's the case, then you should not be binning it, right? You should either not present it or you should present it in a separate column of unknown. Um, it goes back to that case of like, if, if the agent does not think it has any value to add, then don't, don't say that I have this recommendation with 1% confidence, right? It's just not useful to a human to, because you're still going to see it, right? Even if someone tells you it's false, you're still going to see it and it's going to bias you. Um, and then there's a, a question of the cutoffs, right? Um, and in this case, it was relatively easy because there are certain types of um, adverse effects that are well understood, um, and so we could we could incorporate the you know if there's a we could talk to our colleagues and say like okay if a patient has certain types of conditions you need to put them in this in this category. Um, I agree this one this this was a little bit more. Um, you know, arbitrary in terms of like, okay, the, you know, there's like, we're going to set a boundary of like 70% or something like that. And maybe that's something you want people to be able to play with. I'm not sure. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Um, I noticed that you've framed all these as a sort of a legal assistant tool or a medical diagnosis mm -hmm. type of tool. But I was wondering, because these seem to be operating as standalone systems, that means the research group uh, inputs all these things in the systems. But next time, if they are online or if they are networked within a larger system, where they have other systems with other learned responses and inputs, whether the advice that they give and the confidence factor will be higher because of this metadata repository. And of course, the next thing, of course, is when you have the mainstreaming or what you call quantum computing algorithms, and with the deep learning and machine learning skills, whether uh, whether it would enhance its human-like reasoning power, and therefore uh, give people the higher confidence when it when it uh, recommends certain things or presents or uh, information in, uh, certain layouts that are more accurate more professionally accurate. I think this is a great point. Yep. So I, I think research is all about creating abstractions so you can ask precise questions. So in a different part of our research, we work on how can you get the most accurate and most confident recommendations possible. And when you're not accurate, how can your uncertainty reflect that? Uh, you know, so can you at least have, yeah? Right, so we have those models, right, that we're trying to get them as, uh, to perform as well as possible. And then we have, um, uh, you know, these sorts of studies where we wizard of Oz a lot of things. And, and I think we're doing that because of all, some of the other questions that have been asked about learning effects and what happens when you do this thing first and this thing second. Um, and for all of that, we want to be able to keep a constant on the quality of the model, or we want to actually be able to manipulate it and be like, okay, now we're going to give someone something that doesn't work very well see do they notice um, and so I think you're absolutely right that um, you know where, where are these things at the top prediction quality no the other mic no okay not me okay um, uh, so it, I, I think that eventually you want to put them together but for us to understand each of these effects we, we separate them out Uh, hi, Professor Finale. Uh, thank you for this interesting talk. My question is mainly on the application side. I just wanted to know that uh, how is the adoption uh, of these AI-based decision support tools uh, in real-life settings? Like there are certain challenges still existing, but uh, there is a progress in the descriptive uh, 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 diagnostics, but uh, what about the prescriptive diagnostic side, whether there is a certain progress or is it still too early to say? Do you mean in the context, do you mean a specific context like like healthcare, radiology or just in general or? In general healthcare. In general healthcare. Um, so I don't know for um, like, uh, like general practitioners because I have done less work there. Um, I know that in critical care settings, um, there are a number of AI tools that um, uh, basically go bing in terms of warning scores that are, are personalized. Um, in uh, radiology, there are a number of tools that are being used 
to uh, in the in the theme of assistance um, to uh, partially automate tasks, right? Like if, if the radiologist needs to circle something and then it computes the volume of the you know the ventricle or something like this, um, then it can help produce the circle so that they, if anyone's ever had a scan done and you see the person like painstakingly turn a mouse around, <laughs> right? Uh, so they're trying to automate some of those tasks, um, and I see that. Um, you know, very much coming into play. Um, uh, other types of chronic care management, like type two, sorry, type one diabetes um, and insulin pumps, I feel like are pretty well developed in terms of um, control systems. There's work to be done, but those are very like they're out there. Like people use them. Um, I'm sure other people have examples as well. So I, I think that these are starting to be used. You know, they're they're not uh, common, common, but they they're they're absolutely there. Surgery prediction times, that's another thing that's maybe less sexy, but okay, it's commonly thank used. You. Thank, you. Yeah. Thank, thank you very much for the talk. Um, I have a more general question, uh -huh. especially in Europe, there is this um, uh, relationship with the doctors and uh, in general with, let's say, really believing what they say and trusting their opinion. How do we see, uh, let's say, this empowerment, uh, let's, say, let's say, really empowering the, the patient, especially because has been always trusting someone else. Uh, do we believe in the future that actually really um, there could be this change and so trust completely machine learning AI or I wanted Do, do you mean opinion. like uh, between AI and patient or between like how does it affect uh, the Both the sense because um, let's say so far to now, mm -hmm. uh, especially in Europe, there is a high trust in the opinion. So I will have seen the empowerment of the doctors that has different choices and better suggest, let's say, the patient. Mm -hmm. But in this case, my, let's say, from my understandings, um, let's say we are empower, let's say we are empowering the patient. Uh, do we believe that the patient is gonna trust how far the patient may trust, let's say, the use of this AI instead of the doctor? Yeah, I, I think that's a great question. And I think that, I mean, outside of uh, AI tools, we're already seeing a, a shift in the relationship between doctors and patients just with the availability of online resources, right? Like you can go on WebMD, uh, you can go on Mayo Clinic, you can go on all of these websites and learn about your condition. Um, and you can Google for like, what do I do if I have this uh, set of symptoms, right? And when people go into their, um, their the, to their doctors now, um, you know, they come in with, with knowledge, right? That they did not necessarily come in uh, beforehand. So I think there's already a shift that is, that is happening. Um, and I think these tools will continue to be a part of that shift and if built properly, they will, again, encourage the conversation, right? Where the patient can say, but the AI recommended it for these reasons. Um, you know, what do you think about that? And, and hopefully, uh, I'll leave with just two, two pointers here. Like hopefully we, we can calibrate in a way that the, the doctor's opinion will still, hopefully will, will, will matter, right? Because I think that there is something about the experience that is not, cap or there's, there's not something, there's lots of things <laughs> that are, don't go into these AI systems, right? Um, and the doctor may have uh, that, that understanding. Like when I was having my sec second pregnancy, there were some doctors who tried to be very mathematical and they were like, this number is out of range and therefore I am concerned. And I was like, I'm a statistician. <laughs> Numbers go out of range all the time. <laughs> right? um, I don't believe you. <laughs> um, then finally one of them was like, look, I can't explain why, but you know, like this collection of numbers makes me feel deeply uncomfortable. I was like, you know what? I respect that. <laughs> um, you know, you, you, you have some knowledge that you're trying to bring to a situation, and I, I can combine that with studies, um, and, and this makes sense. Um, I also think an open question is how we can encourage this interaction, like we were chatting about just a little while ago, where uh, the, the AI is only going to look at certain features. Um, I think that's going to be true for a long run, right? Uh, for a while, there's so much about our fact, our lives that it's not going to be incorporated. That's super important. Like, can you take a drug at a reliable time three times a day? You know, does your lifestyle support that? Um, you know, do you take a drug that's going to make you fat or, you know, affect your sex life or whatever it is? And people are going to have different preferences. And how to incorporate that, that's kind of where I really see the doctor-patient conversation uh, coming in, at least for the moment. Um, because we don't have good ways to manage that interaction right now. Thank you very much. Uh, 
time. Thank you everyone very much for your participation and uh, thanks for Nelly for such interesting conversation and the talk. And we have already reached the time and uh, thank you everyone. And we are going to close this seminar. Thank you.